So when we actually pursue like energy efficiency in design and development of the web, we make the web faster, um, which is good for user experience, it's good for search engine rankings, it's good for conversion rates. Um, we can also reduce hosting costs potentially by making things run more efficiently. We need less server resources. Um, we can make things more accessible by actually simply just making the user journeys more efficient and more streamlined. Hi, welcome to the Gripe podcast. In this podcast, you will learn how to grow member-based organizations. I am your host, Farhad Khan. I am the CEO of Gripe Digital. We help professional associations grow their membership by building membership websites. We host a number of free learning events. So if you want to grow the membership of your professional association, please take a look at the free learning events on our website at gripe.ca slash events. That is G-R-Y-P-E dot ca slash events. This is the live recording of our podcast episode with a live audience at the recording studio. So if you're joining us live today, welcome. It's great to have you here with us. We will take some questions from the audience. So if you do have any question, please submit them on chat on the right sidebar and we will get to them as soon as we can. Today, we are excited to have Tom Greenwood with us. Tom is the co-founder of Whole Grain Digital and he is also the author of an, of an amazing book, Sustainable Web Design. And Tom is joining us all the way from London, England. Tom, it's so great to have you with us today. Can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and your work? Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, so I run an agency called Whole Grain Digital, as you, as you mentioned, and we've been going since the mid 2000s as a specialist WordPress agency. And we're very much focused on kind of sustainability in, in every sense. So trying to run our business in a way that's like good for the environment, good for society, trying to work on projects that are doing something positive for the environment and for society. Um, and in more recent times, trying to look at how actually like design and development of the web itself has an impact on the environment and how we can actually reduce that. So kind of looking at all those things through and through is really my passion. Um, and that's, and that's where the, uh, the book came from as well. That's amazing. Uh, Tom, can you tell us a bit more about what is sustainable web design? Like we have been designing for a long time, but we have never looked into this. Yeah, absolutely. So sustainable web design in simple terms is basically designing, designing web services to minimize their energy consumption and in the process also reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And you could broaden it out. You could look at other impacts such as water consumption, for example, which sounds completely random and unrelated to web design, but, <laughs> but you'd be surprised. Um, but, you know, at its absolute core, it's about reducing energy consumption of the software that we're building. Um, but if you could look at it more holistically, like the broader environmental and social impact, if you wanted to. Right. So I guess like what you're saying is uh, the website that we are like serving is hosted at a data center. And then if the website like coding and everything else is not efficient, like build, then it will take a lot more energy at the data center. As a result, our carbon footprint will actually go up. That's exactly it as well as, so there's really kind of three big pieces. There's the energy used in the data center for storing and processing the information. There's the energy used in the transmission networks to send that data around the world. And then there's the energy used on the end user device to actually process the information they're being sent and display it to the user. Right. And the end user device, like meaning the laptop or the mobile or the tablets. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So um, what are some of the major advantages of like thinking about sustainability from the very beginning, you think? Like why, why do this? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the obvious one is that there's a climate emergency and every industry, doesn't matter what it is, every sector needs to decarbonize rapidly. Um, and, you know, we tend to think of the digital sector as not really being a part of this conversation because we're, or we tend to think of it as only being part of the conversation about solutions because technology will solve everything. Um, but we tend not to really talk about whether the technology itself has an impact. Um, but the the internet as a whole accounts for roughly 2% of global carbon emissions, which is roughly the same as the global aviation industry. Um, and, you know, we obviously are very aware of the impact of aviation, um, 
but we tend to not think of the impact of digital technology at all. So, so I think on a very like first principles level, we need to look at it as we just need to decarbonize the industry, just like we need to decarbonize every other industry. But then there are other benefits too. There are other reasons why we should do this. So when we actually pursue like energy efficiency in design and development of the web, we make the web faster, um, which is good for user experience. It's good for search engine rankings. It's good for conversion rates. Um, we can also reduce hosting costs potentially by making things run more efficiently. We need less server resources. Um, we can make things more accessible by actually simply just making the user journeys more efficient and more streamlined. Um, so there's lots of potential benefits um, that can be gained from it beyond just the environmental aspects. Right. So I guess uh, we are cutting our cost in general. Is that the case? Yeah. Yeah, I say so it's a, you can cut costs in terms of, for example, hosting costs. Um, you can also potentially increase revenues um, through improved user experience, conversion rates, search rankings and so on. Um, potentially, you like there, there could be slight increased costs up front in terms of the attention to detail required in order to actually achieve the improved efficiency. So that's, you know, it's a trade off in that sense. And I think the higher, the higher traffic, the higher kind of impact you're going to have environmentally, but also then the less significant the actual overhead of the, the cost overhead of pursuing this efficiency is. So if you've got a blog that nobody reads, then the impact, <laughs> the time you'd invest, the money you might invest in actually making it more efficient might not really pay off. Um, but if for anything that's kind of at a reasonable scale, then it definitely makes sense. Right, right. Do you um, have kind of a metric like at which level, like how popular a website has to be for us to be really serious about this? Yeah, so I mean, there's things that you could do even at a low level that don't really cost you very much anyway. So even if you did have that blog that very few people read, you could still do things like put it on a, a web host that um, has a commitment to using renewable energy in the data center that has really good caching in place to make it run more efficiently. And that doesn't necessarily need to really cost you anything. It doesn't require any special skills to do. So I think you could do that at any level, but then once you get into the kind of finer details of design and development, then, you know, I guess if you're getting 10,000 unique visitors a month plus, then, you know, it kind of makes sense to be looking into these things. Right. Uh, can you walk us through a process um, in order to say you're actually like working on a new website design, right? And then like, how would you build sustainability like in, in the design process? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the key things to do to start with is benchmarking. Um, so trying to understand in most cases when you're designing a website, not all, but in most cases these days, there's already something existing, whether it's, whether it's your old website that you're replacing or whether it's like a competitor website uh, that you want to be competing with. So you can benchmark both of those things, the old one and the competitors. Um, and you can benchmark in various ways. So we we developed a carbon calculator for websites um, and there's a free version online at websitecarbon.com. So you could use that for benchmarking or you could use a like a performance metric, which in some ways gives you a clue to the energy impact. So you could use, um, you could use like, uh, data transfer over the wire, um, just using your browser dev tools, you could, you could measure that. Um, or you could use a metric like um, in the Safari browser, they have an energy impact metric um, that you can look at. So there's a few different things you could benchmark potentially. Um, and that gives you a starting point. Um, and then from there, you can sort of plan out, you might set a budget. So for example, we'd sometimes set a page weight budget, which is like the maximum size of a page. Um, Google's given a recommendation that not for environmental reasons, but actually for like accessibility reasons, um, half a megabyte is like a good kind of global mm. hard limit for like page size. So you could, you could set a budget on that basis. You could use, um, you could either set a carbon budget by benchmarking on website carbon.com, um, the old website and your competitors' websites and say, well, okay, we want to get a reduction of X percent. Or you could set a page weight budget and 
set a kind of limit there. Um, and then you've got something to work with. You And you can kind of look at what you've already got and, and where you're trying to get to. And often you're in a situation where you're sort of, you want to reduce the emissions, but you also want to improve user experience. So naturally you would kind of, if if you weren't thinking about this, you'd actually probably increase emissions in the new in the new version because you've made it a richer kind of experience. Um, so the challenge is like for each kind of generation of the website that you're building to say, okay, well, how do we how do we make that user experience more fulfilling, more interesting, um, at the same time as reducing the emissions. So in the design process, it's about like asking really, really hard questions about what exactly is needed, what um, all the stuff you'd usually do, but doing it like with perhaps a much harder nose. Um, <laughs> that when you know, there's a lot of things in websites these days which are are, are really gimmicks, um, and we all kind of know they're gimmicks, but we don't. But we like them anyway, and we know that the client likes them. Um, but actually, being hard nosed and saying, "Yeah, but what's the evidence behind like why we would do this, and is it actually good for the user, not just the environment, but is it good for the user?" And often you find that things, for example, like autoplay video in the background on a website, um, it's like really polluting, but it's also really bad for performance. Um, it's also really bad for accessibility. Um, so there are things like that where you can actually be a lot more hard nosed about these design decisions um, and keep that budget that you've set as kind of a reference point to keep everybody on track and have it as a conversation point. Say, so, yeah, but we all agreed that we we're going to try and stick to this budget. And if we put an autoplay video in the background, then we're going to blow it out of the water. Um, what could we do instead that is actually going to create a great user experience, but without the downsides? And I think that's the interesting kind of creative challenge is figuring out what the how you can get the benefits without the downsides um so that's kind of in the design process is really just asking all those hard questions and thinking more creatively about maybe there's a different way of doing this um and then similarly when you go into development um of actually seeing like how can we optimize these things and and code it in the most efficient way possible so kind of avoiding avoiding like bloated libraries um seeing if we can actually rewrite old code to clear out a lot of the clutter that maybe was sort of doing things really inefficiently. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a creative, a creative process, both in design and development to kind of just find more efficient ways of achieving better outcomes. Right. That reminds me of the autoplay, like huge video that we have on our website. Maybe we should take it down. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the advice, Tom. <laughs> So I want to talk a little more about the user journey. So if you were to kind of like look at the carbon footprint and overall uh, try to deliver a better user experience, like how would you change the experience compared to like what you typically do? Yeah, sure. I think um, I think a sort of a good a good lens for this is really just kind of like minimalist design and and. But I'm, I'm always cautious to use that word because when people think of minimalist design, they think of like sparse, kind of really bare kind of cold, um, you know, if you think about architecture and interior design, for example. Um, but I think like in its true sense, minimalist design is actually about like only including the things that add value and leaving out everything else. So that doesn't have to be cold and sparse. It could actually be a very warm, inviting experience, but everything that's there is really considered. And so from a user from a user experience point of view, what you're doing is you're eliminating clutter, which is like inherently good for the user. And, and you're thinking really carefully about what are they looking for? What are they trying to achieve? And, and, and laying it on a plate for them and making it really easy to sort of guide them through that process in, in as few steps as possible. The longer they spend on the website, the more energy is going to be consumed. Um, the more time, the more things they have to click on, the more things they have to load, the more energy is going to be consumed. And, and equally, that's not great for them either because they don't want to spend time looking for things. They want to find things quickly and easily. So it's a win-win um, for the user and for the environment if we, and, and this is, you know, in a way this is standard user experience principles. Um, it's just about really doubling down on them. Right. Uh, so I guess like in general, we're creating shorter web pages in general, like not too, too long web pages. And then like in each web page, we're kind of like, uh, 
defining a very narrow journey where we give the user what they want with as few clicks as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Helping the helping the user self-identify who they are, what they want, and funnel into something that's really tailored to their needs. Right, right. So um, I guess like this is really um, a mutual responsibility of the development team and the client as well. Um, yeah. Do you have any tools on like how to sell this to clients so they understand this is important? <laughs> yeah. So I think I think the key to selling this to clients is is twofold. One is to take them on the journey of it, of of educating them about the fact that there is an environmental impact of digital technology because I think most people aren't aware of that and and if you assume that the client knows about it then they're going to they're going to look a bit blank and not really know what you're talking about so i think it's important to kind of hold their hand and start at the beginning and walk them through it and and that's an opportunity for them to learn which i think a lot of them actually, a lot of our clients find really interesting but then i think the other half of it is to recognize that that's not why they're buying a website um, <laughs> i mean it might be in like a very rare like niche case but in the majority of cases they're spending money on a website because of some other organizational reason whether it's they've got some sort of commercial goal that they need to achieve that their current website is not achieving um or whether it's because they have some sort of organizational objective um that needs to be communicated in a certain way and the current website's not communicating they have they have practical objectives um that come first and foremost in their minds. So the way that we find is most effective to sell it to them is take them on the journey of explaining about the environmental impact of digital technology, but then tie it back in to the reason why they're actually doing the project in the first place and, and find those synergies where actually by looking through this lens of the environment, we can find ways of improving the user experience or improving conversion rates or improving search rankings um, or reducing hosting costs or, you know, whatever it is that maybe they've already identified is important to them and actually showing how this is going to support them on that. Right. So I guess uh, as the development team, like be it an in-house development team or or a vendor, uh, it's our it's our responsibility to kind of like educate the client on the, in, like, on the impact of sustainable design and how it will kind of like gives them a win-win. Now, yeah. if it is if, like for the client, it can be a decision maker or an actual client, right? So what is their responsibility here? Like what is their role? I think their role is to be an ally in this. Um, I think the best outcomes come, not just in terms of sustainability, but the best outcomes in any web project come when the client or you know whoever that internal stakeholder is, um, really looks at the design and development team as like a, a true partner in this that we're going to we're going to find creative solutions together and and I think if you if they can if you're that person if you're the client or you're the internal stakeholder and you can you can go to the development team and the design team and say well look I've got these commercial objectives but I would also like to kind of champion digital sustainability and see if we can weave that in, then you're actually you're actually supporting them in, in being able to step up and take that seriously and get the win-wins of it. Because I think sometimes there's a, I mean, you might find that the, it could be the other way. So it could be that the design and development team are not familiar with this topic. And so actually as that stakeholder, you could go to them and say, hey, look, like this is something that I've, I'm really interested in. And I would love you guys to get on board with it with me. Um, and it's an opportunity. I think, you know, most designers and developers love solving interesting problems, um, love learning new things. And sustainable web design is like an opportunity to do both of those things. And I think if you can sell it to them that way, then you're, you have a good, a good project team excited about making things better. So as a client, uh, should I also be thinking about maybe cutting down on the requirements and then really like like focusing on a few things that really matter? Yeah, I think so. I think that's always a good approach anyway. Um, I mean, I think that I think that from a client point of view, if you can if you can be less prescriptive with your requirements you're always going to get a better outcome. So it's, and it's like design in any field, not just digital design. Like if you, 
if you prescribe the solution in the brief, you tend you might get a good. It's not that you won't get a good outcome. You could get a really good outcome, but if you if you just prescribe the problem and then collaborate with the people, you know, the designers, the developers to design the solution together, you'll nearly always get a better outcome. So I think if you can be really clear about the problems you're trying to solve, but very open-minded about what the solution is, you could end up with something that's far more efficient and far more effective. Right. Tom, what you just said is so powerful. Like for our audience, do you, do you mind stating it one more time? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so I should just say this. I mean, I, I studied industrial design at university. Um, so I started designing physical things. And this was always the thing where it's like, you're always getting briefs for like design this physical product. And it's like, it's just totally prescriptive about how it's going to be. And you think, well, it's going to be exactly the same as the last one. It's just this one's going to be blue instead of red. Um, <laughs> so really good designs come from briefs that prescribe the solution but keep an open mind sorry briefs that prescribe the problem but keep an open mind as the solution and and that allows you to have this kind of open-minded approach to looking at the problem through from different angles through different lenses and try to find new solutions um and if we i think that's the best way to approach any web design project Right, right. So, uh, Tom, like we are a big proponent of reducing waste in general. So be it like yeah. carbon footprint or anything, right? Because we work with a lot of associations who whose technology is really outdated, like oftentimes, right? And then um, up until like COVID, they didn't really have a real need to like revamp their tech. And then now mm-hmm. like uh, they have like a dire need to engage members online. Yes. So um, if we are trying to kind of like reduce waste and then uh, give our clients more in our actual like a design process, like day to day, right? So as a development team in the workshop with the class and, and like everything else, like what practices would you put in place for this? You mean physical waste in the actual workshops, for example? No, I'm, uh, I mean, like when we are doing the design, you know, like yeah. uh, as uh, like as the development team, how would we actually like change our day to day practice? Like if I'm a graphic ah. designer, if I'm a developer, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, so, there's a lot of there's a lot of aspects of waste that we can eliminate in in web designs. Um, some of it is some of it is is kind of in the visual design itself. So it depends how you define waste. But for example, an image that fills the whole screen is sort of significantly larger in terms of file size than an image that that fills a quarter of the screen. But actually, you could design the whole screen with the smaller image incorporated to have just as powerful visual effect, perhaps even greater, because often full screen images are then difficult to incorporate with messaging um, and so on. So, so you could argue that actually the full screen image is is waste. So you can look at it kind of through that lens of actually pure file size waste um, on the in the visual design, but you can also look kind of behind the scenes and see waste. So, for example. It's sticking with images again, like the file format you use potentially is wasteful. So JPEG images are kind of generally considered to be relatively efficient in terms of their file size compared to like a GIF or a PNG for a photograph. But actually they're really inefficient if you compare them to modern formats like WebP or AVIF. AVIF files are supported by um, a pretty large number of modern browsers now, um, but they're like half the size of JPEG files for the same quality of image. So if so you could look at that and say, well, JPEG image is therefore inherently wasteful. Um, similarly, font files. Um, if you're designing a website that's only in English um, and you use a font that has all of the characters for like 10, 20 languages, um, but you but the website is only in English, then people are loading a font file that contains characters that are never going to be used. So that's inherently waste. Um, and you can sub, you know, really easily, you can subset font file down to specify the languages used on the website and just strip out all of the characters that were never going to be used. Um, so that's another way of eliminating waste. Um, similarly in, in development, um, build tools, like a really powerful way of stripping out waste in code of just automatically finding all the things that really don't need to be there, the things that are duplicated or the things that are there only for like to make the development process easier, but don't need to be there on the live website, um, for example, and just strip that all out when it actually goes 
to the production server. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of things like that that we can look at. Um, a design system is also a really powerful way of looking at this eliminating waste. So um, a design system where you've got like modular reusable design elements and then you and then you you're coding the site based on the design system. So your CSS is based on this modular pattern and you're reusing these repeatable mm -hmm. items. Over the long term of the product, that's going to massively reduce waste in like your CSS and the amount of images that you're using and storing on the website and so on, because you're not putting the same things in and again and again. And if you use a website, I think it's cssstats.com, um, you put your URL in and it gives you like a, a visualization of what's in the CSS. Um, and it's interesting how like, I mean, it even happens on new websites, particularly if you put in an old website that's had a lot of work done on it by different developers over many, you know, many years. And you find like the same colors and the same styles are declared like, you know, 40, 50 times sometimes. It's like crazy because they people there was no system from for them to work from. And so every time they were like, oh, I need a red button, I'll just code a red button. Um, whereas if you've got a design system, you can actually keep the code really 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 refined and efficient not just on day one when you first launch it but you know three years later it could still be super efficient and so you're you're kind of setting yourself up to avoid waste creeping in over time right and um tom you're making me think now uh, to be honest uh, we are working on a large uh, media website right now like like hundreds of pages right and like many many templates that we're actually having to build and like i have been like enforcing this rule from the very beginning for the designer and the development team like to build everything using templates like if you're using this design here reuse the design as many times as you can before yeah. coming up with another new pattern to represent the same like area so so i think like that's exactly what you're saying right exactly yeah exactly don't design everything from scratch you know again every time like build this library of reusable components right and i guess this is uh good for the user experience in general as well because like as people are kind of like browsing your website they're getting used to certain design elements and design patterns and like when they go to a new page when they see the same design they're they feel at home right so exactly. they know like how to use that area of the site so it's much better that way Exactly. It's familiar to them and, you know, they, they learn the patterns and they know what to do when they see the same things again and again. And also you're potentially saving money over the long term because although there's a little bit, a little bit of thought required to kind of organize things and plan the design system, over time, one of the biggest challenges with a lot of websites is maintenance. And how do you maintain this kind of growing beast of, <laughs> of code, you know, um, whereas if you've kept it really refined and organized from the beginning and a lot of things are reused um then actually what you're trying to maintain is is contained right and uh you touched on a very important point i think like tom like people look at the initial cost of the website at the very beginning and they think like oh my god it's so expensive right but i think the initial cost is almost nothing compared to the maintenance cost uh, like mm -hmm. over the years because the website will probably live on for two three sometimes four years and then like, you actually have to support in maintaining during the entire time keep it up to date and we yeah. spend a lot of time and effort doing that so if you can cut down then then uh, that's probably a huge win yeah exactly yeah Right. Okay. So um, we we actually like build a lot of membership portals in general, and like where like the same sites are actually being reused by members again and again. Right. So I guess like um, you're also what you're also saying is that the pages that will be used more frequently by users, like that's like that's where we can get the biggest bang for the buck if we optimize them first. Yeah, definitely. So there's a relationship, obviously, between um, the the efficiency of of the page and the number of people that visit it. So you might have parts of your website that might be relatively inefficient, but if they get almost no traffic, maybe you don't need to worry about them so much, but then you've got pages that get high levels of traffic and they're the ones that you generally want to put the most effort into optimizing. And some of the optimizations you do will be global. They're in the code and design kind of at a global level and they benefit everything. But, but if there's specific things, um, that are only in certain sections of the site, you want to focus your efforts on the ones that get the most traffic. Right, right, makes sense. And I guess like uh, those those pages will probably be what, the login page and some other some other pages you can think of, can you? Yeah, so it would be, I mean, on the, before you log in, it would be obviously the home page, the page where you, where you log in, the page where you arrive after you log in. Um, and then 
after that, there's probably on a membership site, there's probably like one or two areas that te- most people spend most of their time. Um, so identifying what those are would be would be helpful. Events, maybe an event registrations, those pages. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and looking at it, you know, in a membership site, you've got that they're templated. So for example, your events template will be the same template for all events. And mm-hmm. the registration template will be the same registration template for all events. So um, well, it probably will be. So actually if you do it once in the template, you benefit across every every page that uses it. Right. So uh, nowadays we are working on a lot of um, uh, websites where we are trying to implement inclusive design, you know, like with Mm -hmm. a huge focus on accessibility. Is there a way for us to kind of like build sustainability and accessibility hand in hand, you know, like right at the very beginning? Yeah, there is. So so there's an overlap that they're sort of separate but related. So a lot of the stuff that you do in um, accessible design and development um, doesn't inherently make it more sustainable, but there's definitely no downside to it from a sustainability point of view. And, it, um, and I think just keeping, you know, the, the, the code super organized is like very much complementary, um, like good quality code. Um, but the big, the big overlap where the two things are very much the same is in like the literal, um, the literal accessibility of the website. So we've got accessibility in terms of like WCAG standards and can you use it with a screen reader and is the color contrast correct? And, um, you know, all of the different kind of aspects of those standards, which are brilliant. But then the literal accessibility is kind of one step back from that. It's like, can you actually get to the website? Um, <laughs> can you can you actually load it? Um, and I think we sometimes take this for granted because those of us that work in web tend to have like, high powered devices and really fast internet connections because it's our jobs to, that we work on the web. So we need that stuff. Um, and we're also to be relatively privileged people from a financial point of view, we can afford good connections and good devices, but, but actually there's a lot of situations where people don't have that, um, in particularly like mobile users. So people who are out and about, even if they do have a really good device, they may have a terrible connection and, and we can sometimes again, take that for granted because you think, oh, in a city, the signal is generally pretty good. But it's amazing how often it's not that good and things are sort of painfully slow to load, particularly if you're a commuter, you go on a train. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but, you know, you take a train in the UK and, uh, (laughs) you know, you can spend like large periods of time just hitting refresh. Like, you know, you can't load the most basic thing. Um, And actually you'll find it's the it's the web pages that are built super efficiently that you can load. while you're while you're in those places with poor signal and it's the ones that are really bloated and inefficient that are just you know literally inaccessible and that's you know for those of us who are actually privileged enough to live in places where we've got good devices and good reasonably good connections most of the time but then if we should look at who the audience is for the for the product we're building because actually we might be serving people in rural communities where actually maybe this is more this the poor connection might be more normal for them um mm. And, and particularly people in developing countries where not only might they have much slower connections, but data might be actually very expensive relative to local incomes. So we might think like, oh, a megabyte is nothing and I've got like unlimited data, so I don't care. But actually a megabyte of data might be really expensive relative to the income of somebody in a developing country. And if, if a w- web page is like one megabyte, just to load one page, um, you're literally burning through their, you're burning through their income. Um, and there's a social justice issue there where it's like they don't even know it's going to happen because nobody, you don't get a little... It's not like when you buy something in a shop and there's a price on it and then you choose to buy it with the web. You click on the link, then it loads and the money and the data's already gone. Um, <laughs> it'd be like if you walked into a shop and nothing had a price on it. And... <laughs> And then you have to like walk to the checkout and they've already taken the money from your account. And you're like, what? Um, that's what's happening to people on um, like really bloated web services and particularly people on low incomes. You know, even in even in Western countries, people on low incomes are, have the most expensive data because they're the people who can't afford an unlimited plan. So they'll buy like the cheapest pay as you go plan, which is the most expensive per gigabyte. Um, so there's definitely a crossover in terms of like the efficiency aspect of like um, in terms of accessibility and inclusivity, in terms of 
like can people physically access it in the place where they are at the time when they need to access the information and can they afford to access it um those two things i think are really like at the center of that venn diagram of where um sort of inclusive design and sustainable design overlap and i like the example that you mentioned that like even if you have good connection and whatnot you may be on a train you may be like commuting you may yeah. be out and about in a rural area right and you may not actually have the have the like most like optimum device or connection at that point in time. So I, th I think like thinking about all those factors, if we build in like accessibility from the get go and sustainability from the get go, then we are actually serving our core or broader audience much, much better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always say you should try and design for people who are commuting on the train because <laughs> not, not designed for people who are sat in a, you know, like a web design office with a fiber optic connection. <laughs> and, right. uh, if it, if you've got a great experience on the train, you're going to have a great experience everywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, talking about experience on train, like we're in Ottawa, Canada, and then over here, even trains break down, forget internet. So <laughs> <laughs> my first priority is actually to get to my destination, you know, like I'll worry about internet later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah given the weather like it's always like in the winter it's like snowing all the time right so it's bad yeah. the weather is really bad in the winter although that's even more reason why you need a good connection because you need to be able to tell people i'm stuck on the train the train's yeah. over there <laughs> there you go there you go when you're running yeah. late on a meeting yeah yeah <laughs> All right. So when we take a look at uh, kind of like some other activities that, that an association might do, like besides say like websites and whatnot, their regular member engagement, like events, activities, are there other things that they can do kind of like to reduce their carbon footprint? Um, yeah, I mean, I think on uh, on member websites specifically, I think one of the things that, um, well, a couple of things that I think would generally be really important. One is is simplicity of the design. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be kind of user-generated content, um, and actually having a really simple user interface is going to make it really easy to read um, and really fast to load. So that's going to be a win-win for everybody. Um, it doesn't need. It's not like where you're generating like marketing pages and everything needs to be kind of flashy. You actually could keep a lot of it quite simple. I think in a lot of parts of membership sites on the inside. Um, but also I think there's a, an aspect of like getting a really good caching process in place on the server, because you've got this kind of combination of like static content that's already posted. It's already there as well as perhaps interactivity where people can actually um, maybe contribute comments and things in certain areas. So I think having really well thought through caching policies so that the server isn't having to like query everything and generate everything on the fly every time somebody looks at something, um, but still allows that interaction where required um, will make a big difference in terms of the server resources used. Right, right, yeah. So, Tom, if we take a step back from the website, say, and then, sure. like, yeah. find, you know, like find out like what are the different member engagement like activities an association will typically do? Maybe phone calls, maybe holding yeah. events and other activities, right? Are there things we can do there? Uh, yeah. Well, I guess I mean. I mean, definitely. Um, it's always a balance between what's going to work and what's the impact, you know, the environmental impact going to be. I think phone calls are like the most efficient thing. Um, so we're all got into this kind of world where we think that like video calls are the norm. Um, but actually like a good old fashioned phone call um, uses like minimal energy. Um, hence, even in the olden days, you could like pick up a phone um, and call somebody like halfway across the world and and it would work because the amount of energy required to do that is very small. Whereas uh, like modern internet calling, particularly with video is, although it's like a, a much more rich user experience, it's much more energy intensive. Um, so I'd say like definitely like embrace, <laughs> embrace the telephone um, is definitely one thing. And I think if, if people are going out and about thinking about in, in terms of like on the streets, then I think, there's lots of things in terms of actually like how do people get there and, and and mobilizing local people so you're not necessarily having like teams of people who are like traveling all around the world all around the country the same team you might it's much more efficient to have for example local teams in local places who understand the local culture better uh, but also they're already there like they don't have to drive around in a um, to visit all these different places so I think just thinking about locality 
um, can have a big impact as well. Right, right. Um, you mentioned a tool that we can like, use to kind of like um, uh, see how efficient a website is. Can you share that with our audience? Yes. Um, so websitecarbon.com. Websitecarbon.com, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the carbon calculator for, that we developed. Okay. So what do we do? We just like enter our website there and then it will kind of like give you like the footprint. Exactly that. Yeah. So you just pop in a URL and then you can on the results page, when it gives you the results, you can actually adjust. It'll give you the result like per visitor. Mm -hmm. um, so you can just multiply that up yourself, but there's also, if you scroll down, um, it will give you the, the impact for 10,000 visitors, but you can actually adjust that yourself. So you could put in your traffic volumes um, and get like an annual or monthly kind of uh, amount of energy and, and carbon. Right. I want to run this on google.com to see what we get. <laughs> well, I mean, I haven't tested it recently, but google.com has always been like kind of famous, famous for its efficiency. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it should be pretty good. That should be the benchmark factor that we should all follow, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. All righty. So Tom, you and I can talk about this like all day, but I want to like jump into some audience questions. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start with uh, a question from our team member, Ronia. So Ronia, Ronia always has uh, like exciting questions. So Ronia is asking, uh, what are some like, examples of like common design choices that we do, we make that actually have terrible environmental impact? Sure. Well, I, so really common ones. I mean, I mentioned the autoplay, uh, the autoplay background video um, is, is <laughs> that's definitely, definitely up there on the list. Um, Another one I'd say is like using like loads of different uh, loads of different fonts in a design because every time you use a different font, even if it's a different weight of the same font family, you're having to load a different file. So uh, like that's quite a common thing. Um, another one I think is really interesting that's a common practice is a, is a white background. Um, so on OLED screens, which is kind of the modern technology, more and more screens are adopting. Every pixel lights up individually, so like millions of tiny light bulbs. Um, and and so the brighter they are, the more energy they're using. Um, the darker they are, the less energy they're using. So dark backgrounds would use less energy on the end user's device, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a laptop. Um, and light and white backgrounds will always use the most energy. So, but white backgrounds are kind of standard in web design. So moving away from white backgrounds, I think is like a really good thing that we could embrace in design. And it doesn't mean you've got to go black, um, but I think just challenging whether white as default needs to be the standard um, could make a big difference. Right, and maybe like finding a middle ground in between where it's not so dark as hurting your eyes, uh, you know, and not exactly. too bright either. Yeah, exactly. And this comes back to the like accessibility and inclusivity aspect, where actually there's there's probably a middle ground which is be better than white from an environmental point of view, um, but actually also better than white from a readability point of view, because um, it's it's a kind of there's enough contrast, but it's also not too strong that it's actually harsh that people struggle to tr struggle to to read it right okay our next question is from andrea springer so andrea is asking what is the best way to communicate our digital sustainability without it being pretentious or gimmicky <laughs> um <laughs> I think I think the best way is to have the conversation in and explain what you've done. So actually, I think two things. One is explain what you've actually done so that people can understand the changes you've made rather than you could just put a badge on your website somewhere that says this website is eco-friendly, which I think would be um, exactly what you're trying to avoid. Um, but it wouldn't really mean anything. It would look a bit pretentious. It would be a bit gimmicky. Um, but I think if you actually if you actually did something on your website where you've told the story of how you learned about the environmental impact of your website and you've made tangible changes and you've talked about what those changes are, then you're actually helping like take other people on that journey, um, helping other people to learn and, and take those learnings that you've found into their own projects. And I think that's I think that's much more meaningful. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I suggest in general right okay 
Our next question is from Mary Andre Kutter. So she is asking, does eco-friendly also means long-term sustainability in the world, world of web? Does it also mean long-term sustainability? I mean, I'm not quite sure exactly uh, what, I'm not sure exactly what the question is asking in terms of long-term sustainability, but I, I think there's a broader, there's a broader question around um, the kind of the bigger environmental impact of digital technology and, you know, the ecological crisis that we're facing and, and all of the other aspects around like electronic waste and, um, and the obsolescence of, all of the consumer devices and feature creep that means that we actually have to keep upgrading our devices and all of these things. So I think that, um, I think that pursuing like this efficiency in, in web design and development supports all of that, but I don't think it like on its own is going to solve all of those big long-term challenges that we face. I think, you know, there's many things that need to play into that to actually, um, solve these giant challenges right right i think mary is in the audience today um mary would you like to like jump on to camera and maybe like uh clarify your question or does it answer your question okay i'll let her think all right uh so in the in the meantime um i guess like do you have any key takeaway for our audience today yeah so i think the key takeaway um would be to start the conversation about digital sustainability. And the reason that I think that's the most important thing is that this is a topic that actually isn't even on most people's radars. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's one thing for like a few people to like really go deep and try to make everything super efficient. But, <laughs> but what we need is like the whole web to be super efficient. Um, so I think actually making it a common conversation that there's like a high level of awareness, everybody knows about it, means that everyone can start doing something. And I think a lot of people doing a bit is going to make more impact than a few people doing a lot. Um, so yeah, I'd say starting the conversation is the, the key thing. Right. And every bit helps. Every bit helps. Whatever you can exactly. do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so like I've been driving an electric vehicle, I think like for many, many years now, like from like back when it wasn't even like popular, but very expensive, like difficult to get you order in, you get <laughs> one year later, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but like back then, what I was thinking is that like the biggest carbon life footprint that I have right now as a family and myself is is the car that I drive, you know, yeah. like, I'm, like I drive, I used to drive before COVID for sure, I used to drive so much. And then I was thinking the one impact that I can make is actually this. And then I was, you know what, let's go for it. Let's go for it. So... <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Have you got um, have you, how what's the charging situation like where you are in Canada? It's amazing. It's phenomenal. So so I drive yeah. a Tesla and the superchargers are everywhere. You know, so yeah. like anywhere I want to go, I don't actually have a have a problem like charging. And at home, like I'm charging at home all the time, right? So and yeah. in in general, like even like your your cost saving, right? So typically, uh, if if I was when I was driving like a gas vehicle, I was probably like spending like three hundred to four hundred dollars in gas every month. My wow, my. Yeah, and my charging like uh, bill right now is only fifty bucks. That's nothing, <laughs> you know. Can you that's imagine? That's really good. <laughs> so yeah, that's really good. The car the car pays for itself. <laughs> yeah, the car pays for itself. Totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. Book. Already. Um, so uh, yeah, just to wrap up very quickly, Tom, uh, can you share a personal habit that has contributed the most to your success for our audience? Uh, yes. So. I think, I th well, one personal habit that's contributed the most to my success, I think, is probably my obsession in general with with natural health. Um, and, and I say that in like the broadest sense of the term, because um, I'm looking at this more of like preventative rather than curative. Um, so, so I like, I try to eat as close as I can to like whole foods, plant-based diet. I run as close as I can to barefoot, which sometimes is actually with bare feet, but sometimes is like with minimalist footwear. Um, mm. Swimming in the sea. Um, barefoot running is hard though. <laughs> depends on what you're running on. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I think, and all of those things, 
to loop it back around to how it's contributed to my success, I think I think in a couple of ways. One, I think it's it's helped me to just be healthier and more resilient physically and mentally. Um, but two, it's helped me to like take on challenges and and help me to to question the status quo um, of like kind of fairly standard everyday things, which then helps kind of shift my mind in like other things I'm approaching in my work, for example, and it helps me to open my mind and look at things in a different way. Right. That's wonderful. Tom, how can people reach you if they have any questions? Uh, you can either find me on LinkedIn, um, Tom Greenwood. There's actually several Tom, there's a lot of Tom Greenwoods, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you'll find me. I'm the one that works for Holgrain Digital and, um, or just go to the Holgrain Digital website and, um, Drop me a message to the contact form. Alrighty. Tom, thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Alrighty. That's great. That was the episode with Tom Greenwood today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Uh, Tom actually gave us a lot of things to really think about. You know, like before speaking to Tom, I wasn't even thinking about sustainable web design. But I guess like moving forward, any new website project we work on, we will think about sustainability for sure. And we will have a discussion with the client too. So I guess um, you will be able to put some of these ideas into action as well in your in your day-to-day -day lives. And also, once again, like if you want to grow the membership of your professional association, we have a number of learning events that are there on our website so please go to our website and like sign up for one of the events they are at gripe.ca slash events that is g-r-y-p-e dot c-a slash events and if you are joining us from youtube uh, please drop us a comment whenever you actually watch this video and we will get back to you as soon as we can this is the last episode of our podcast before the holidays so i hope you all actually get some time to relax and then connect with friends and family and have an enjoyable time uh, we wish you happy holidays and a happy new year Bye for now.